What's up, everyone? Welcome here to another episode on the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. I'm Yelis Vaas, your host, and uh, also I'm a fellow cardiac arrest survivor. Here on the podcast, I chat with other survivors, like uh, the guest that I'm having today, Winnie Donahue, uh, who is someone from Ireland. So it's the first person from Ireland on the show, so that's pretty awesome. Because I'm trying to, you know... Um, diversify the podcast with uh, guests from other parts of the world to show um, that it is something that happens everywhere around the whole world but also if you are a survivor listening to hopefully also show that everywhere around the whole world there are heart warriors so everywhere in every part of the world there is another cardiac arrest survivor walking around as well so you are not alone even though it can really feel like that, right? Because, well, the percentage of survivors is very, very small. But hopefully by collecting these stories from different people, from different ages, from different countries, you can get a sense, uh, well, that you're not alone. Please enjoy this episode between me and the cardiac arrest survivor and heart warrior, Winnie Donahue. Winnie, a, wo- a warm welcome here to... Uh the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. It's really good to to talk to you. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for thanks for having me. You're uh, you're the first person from Ireland, so uh, that's pretty cool too. I think. <laughs> okay, so I'm re- really representing here. Wow. Yeah, uh, totally. No totally, pressure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, that's lovely. That's lovely. Yeah. It's nice to have a variety of you know experiences and yeah. perspectives. You know, different cultures, different health systems. You know, it's it's interesting. Yeah. I agree. Because uh, everywhere it's slightly different. But there's common, uh, there's common uh, things, of course, uh, uh, everyone. But I, 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 the reason why I wanted to diversify the podcast with different countries is also to kind of show to people that this is something that happens everywhere around the whole world. Mm. Uh, it can happen to anyone, right? Um, sure. And, well, that's kind of what we're going to dive into here, right? Uh, your story. Because mm-hmm. you had a cardiac arrest. Uh, I have no idea about your story yet. So I'm really curious to ask where and when did it start? Um, yeah, so it was 2020. I had my cardiac arrest in September. Um, so it was kind of peak COVID times. And totally out of the blue. No, very, very healthy, you know, fit, healthy don't smoke, don't drink, don't eat red meat. Um, And I just woke up in the middle of the night with like terrible crushing pain in the center of my chest. And I knew immediately, okay, something is seriously wrong here. So I turned to my husband and I said, you know, I'm, I need to see a doctor. It was about three o'clock in the morning, I think. And I had two children at the time who were just Mm -hmm. turning just about to turn three and just about to turn five. So my husband was kind of like, don't wake, don't wake up the kids. He was a bit annoyed. He was like, just don't wake them up. And I said, no, I'm, I'm in trouble here. So I went to call an ambulance and I couldn't manage it. So I, I called him and I said, you need to call an ambulance. So he, he did. And, um, luckily it was peak COVID. So the, the ambulance times were, were way down the ambulance response times were way down because mm-hmm. um in ireland and in, in in dublin like the ambulance response times can be can be high like currently the system isn't you know uh they can be up to like 30 or 40 minutes but wow, nobody was calling ambulances you know yeah. during that first wave of covid everybody was avoiding hospitals um yeah. so it came within 10 minutes and Yes, I, I just went into cardiac arrest in the ambulance. So oh. I'm so lucky wow. <laughs> that that happened. Uh, yeah, so that's kind of what happened for me. And I I think that the couple of things that kind of were precursors to it, I, I was feeling bad uh, kind of in the, in the day, the day running up to it. I was feeling a little bit run down. Mm-hmm. I went to bed a bit early, mm-hmm. but also I started just that evening was my second evening starting the, the Wim Hof method. 
You know, oh, the, yeah, yeah, I know him. The, yeah. You know, uh-huh. the where you the Iceman. Yes, exactly. So mm-hmm. I was just doing it in, in my house. So just like a freezing cold shower. Mm-hmm. and then doing the like hyperventilation breathing exercises um which are contraindicated if you have a heart problem so uh don't do that if you have a heart problem but i had no no heart problem to speak of so um but i always wonder that i wonder oh maybe that maybe that triggered something off for me or activated an underlying weakness or something but yeah Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you you said that you had pain chest yeah at night how i I mean yeah how did you know that it was something entirely different that it was a significant thing what what did you feel actually yeah it woke me up so it it was undeniable like i woke up with this like it was like there was a car on my chest it was Uh. like immediately there was no question my body was screaming at me like you're in danger you know, um, there was no equivocation, no like, oh, I wonder, will I call? Like, will I call? It was like, no, it was like, bam, I'm dying here. Call an ambulance. Like, I immediately knew that something seriously was wrong. Because I know I know that for, for women, you can, you know, manifest in kind of heart attacks can manifest in subtle ways. Heart attacks that then go on to develop into a cardiac arrest included. But for me, it was not subtle. You know, it was... It was very clear. Wait, you had a heart attack? So I had, they think, a heart attack that, okay, so they didn't know what had happened to me. So I I went in, I had my cardiac arrest in the ambulance, went in. I was showing signs of of an MI, like, you know, myocardial infraction. So of a classic, they knew that something was wrong based on my rhythm. But then they did an angiogram when I got into the hospital and my, everything was pristine. Everything was clear, you know, but um, they could see an area of damage, you know, a subsequent MRI showed an area of damage. So Mm. they knew that something had happened in this particular area of my heart. And um, they really debated what it was, you know, that like, all of my arteries were clear. I was, my heart was in perfect health. Um, so their best guess at the time was that I'd had a SCAD heart attack. I don't know if you've come across that before. No, what is that? So it's, it's SCAD, S-C-A-D, and it stands for Spontaneous Coronary Artery Dissection. And it's basically where the wall of your artery, one of the arteries, just spontaneously peels away from itself. And causes okay. a temporary blockage in the artery, which you basically stop causes a heart attack. Um, and it it primarily it's I think it's over not, affects uh, women in over ninety percent of cases, and it's usually women like younger women, so kind of uh, premenopausal women, so on the younger end of, of things, and often it's related to um, childbirth and pregnancy. So they think that it's like related to hormones, like hormonal shifts. Um, so in my case, I had an almost three-year-old who, who I was still breastfeeding at the time, like just, and I mean a tiny bit, just a, a tiny bit, like once a day before she went to sleep. But the doctors really kind of held on to that. And they said, I think it's a SCAD. I think it's related to maybe your breastfeeding. And I was very skeptical of that because... I was giving her, it was like three years into, like the hormonal shifts of breastfeeding happen like when you're exclusively breastfeeding, like in the early days, like almost three years out, you know, things have stabilized. I was only giving her a tiny bit of milk. Anyway, that was my diagnosis, which Mm -hmm. was SCAD. Yeah. So that's the best hypothesis that they have of why you had this cardiac arrest. At the time it was. Okay. At the time well, it was. Yeah. And, uh, um, but then I, I kind of knew from the amount of debating that was going on between the consultants, like the care I got was like amazing. I was in the Matter Hospital in Dublin, which is the heart center hospital. You know, it's, it's the center of excellence for cardiac care in Dublin. And 
I was in the CCU, which is the cardiac intensive care unit. And I was in there for two weeks. Um, and they held on to me until they implanted a, an SICD, a subcutaneous uh, defibrillator. Um, but I could tell, like there was, I, I could tell I was a bit of a unicorn that like the professionals were interested in me, like the cardiologists and the consultants were interested in my case because I was, I was so young because I'd like, there was no other issues because I'd survived. Um, but the first doctor who came in to me, I recognized because he had been my mother's doctor. My mother passed away from a cardiac arrest back in 2002. Oh. So yeah, yeah. I knew him because he was like legendary in our house. You know, oh, Dr. Keeling, like he's amazing, Ted Keeling. Mm. Um, so I was like, is this, is this something genetic? Do you know what I mean? Like surely there's some connection between my case and my mother's case. And my, my mother had a brother who died in his sleep from a cardiac issue when he was 23. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there was, you know, there's all these random, you know, yep. unusual events happening that are all, you know, involving sudden cardiac death or cardiac arrest. Um, but they came to the conclusion that they were totally, it was a total coincidence, you know? So they did they, genetic tests and they didn't I, find I had something. to push for those. I, ha I had to really push, oh. push for genetic testing. They, they kind of felt that my uncle's case was a structural issue with his heart, that my mother's was electrical. And then they had, um, they determined that mine was this SCAD heart attack, which is, is not an electrical issue. Um, it just led to an uh, electrical event, you know? Um, so anyway, I kind of, I left the hospital and, and my overriding concern was for my children. You know, it's like, what's, what's going on? Like, I'm, you know, so I really pushed for, number one, I pushed for cardiac rehab because, and they really didn't want to give me cardiac rehab because of my, because I didn't have a, a classic MI, I didn't have a classic heart attack. And they're like, you're not a candidate for it. You know, your arteries are clear. Your lifestyle is good. You don't need it. But I really needed it because psychologically I was very afraid to raise my heart rate or yep. to, you mm. know, particularly because with SCAD, they gave me clear guidelines around avoiding certain physical movements. So avoiding Valsalva movements. So kind of like movements where you're like, say you're lifting a heavy weight and you're straining, you're straining at movements where you're kind of like this, you're like doing this. Um, but also like lunges and um, squats, like those kind of movements that would have been part of a normal exercise routine, like planks. Like I wasn't supposed to do planks, for example. Still, um, you are not allowed. I, to do I still that, don't or? do them. I I err on this. See, the thing about this SCAD is there's there's not a lot of information. It's a pretty unusual condition. Also, it's it's a female majority condition, which and those conditions tend to be under researched if they affect primarily females. So I, I think that's changing now, and there there is some amazing research going on into SCAD currently. Like every month, I see like more and more strides happening in the area which is amazing um but so the cardiac rehab was a lifesaver for me psychologically you know just to get my confidence back in terms of yeah in a safe place moving. yeah with professionals yes yeah yeah i can absolutely. see that yeah okay. wow that's uh so now after four years it's still kind of unclear it's still the scat thing that they think. Well, that? no, actually, I, I, I got a second opinion. So uh -huh. yeah. I went to my consultants and I said, look, I've found this SCAD expert in the UK, mm -hmm. David Adlam, um, in the University of Leicester. And I said, I want I want to see him. You know, can you can you refer me to him? So my consultant did that. And I had, um, he sent over my angiogram, you know, results. 
And I had a meeting with him last year. And he said, Winnie, I see 10, 15 scads every day. Like, he's like, all scad all day. That's, you know, he looks at Angios of scad and he said, you did not have a scad. In my opinion, it's not a scad. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, and it, it, it was it was very destabilizing because I had hmm. I had come to terms with a certain narrative of what had happened. Right. Do you know right. what I mean? Yeah, and I knew totally. the likely of it happening again or not happening. I knew the genetic, you know, component or not. There was no genetic component to it. So I was I was comfortable with it. Yeah, you dealt so, with that information. Exactly. Yeah, I dealt yeah. with that information. Um, but his belief was that I had had, he, he saw evidence of, of two small blood clots, that I had two, two small blood clots. So he sent me, he sent notice to my team in Dublin, uh, suggesting some other tests to do. So ambulatory monitoring, extended ambulatory monitoring, which showed up nothing. That's and the test that you did? Yes. Extended. What well, that was one test. I did two tests. So the first one was where you you know you wear a halter. No, it wasn't yeah. a halter. It was stuck on, and it just it, it basically recorded my my beats, like my heartbeats over two weeks, just over to see weeks. if there was mm. over two weeks. Yeah, yeah, it was just very strong adhesive, and it was just here. Um, it was a it kind recorded... of holder. Pardon? Uh, it was a kind of holder. Yeah, it was like a, a like one of those uh, halt, halt. What are they called? Holster monitors. Except it was stuck. Okay. It was stuck onto me. You know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um. But yeah, that showed that showed up nothing. Like my heart rhythms were completely normal. There was no irregularities over that two week period. And then I went for a bubble echo. Um. So. What is that? <laughs> A bubble echo is basically they're looking for a hole. They're looking for a hole in the heart. So they put some solution, some like, what's the word? Aerated solution. So some saline or something that has bubbles in it, like it's carbonated in some way. And they push it into one chamber of the heart. And then they wait to see that you're getting an echo at the same time. You know, the kind of the oh. sonogram of the heart. Yeah. Sure. And they're looking to see if they can see the bubbles move to the other chamber of the heart. And if they can see bubbles in the other chamber of the heart, they know that there's a hole somewhere oh. because the solution has traveled yeah, from yeah. one chamber to the other. So that came back positive. So there is mm. a hole there. I have a hole in my heart. And now they are going to close it. So they think now that that hole may be led to these two blood clots developing and those blood clots caused yep. cardiac arrest. I see. Wow. Okay. And how recent is this news for you, this information? It was a few months ago. It was pre pretty okay. recent. Fair yeah, enough. about two months ago. You know when the surgery is, or when they're going to do this? Yeah, I have to see a few. A few I I have to see a few more doctors. So okay. I haven't seen the. They put me under um. My consultant to date has been like a an electrocardiologist. Is that the right name? But yeah, I guess so. Yeah. He he deals with the electrics yeah. of the heart, yeah. mm -hmm. but now he's referring me to a structural cardiologist who deals with you know say holes in the heart. Yeah. But there's one more thing. So pre, so my cardiac arrest was in September 2020. In April 2020, I had a couple of incidences where um, it, I, it looked like I may have had a suspected TIA, so um, mini stroke. Um, and because I had the cardiac history of my my mother, my GP, which is my general practitioner, my local doctor, my family doctor, sent me to the hospital to just get checked out in case there was a cardiac issue. So I did get checked out. You know, I got everything done. I had a brain scan. I had like a, 
an echo done, the whole shebang. And they were like, no, your heart is clear. Your brain is clear. You're, you're good to go. So I actually was delighted by this news because I'd always had this, this feeling in the back of my head about my mom. I'm like, oh, maybe there's a little heart issue there. And I wouldn't have done the Wim Hof stuff if I hadn't have had all of these tests back in April that, you know, cleared my heart, you know. Anyway, so now there, I need to see a, a stroke specialist as well, just in case. I, I Wait, yeah. just for me to be correct with the timeline. Sure. This was all after your cardiac arrest, right? The stroke? No, no. I, oh, I mean, was... I, I don't think I had a stroke. They said I did not have a stroke, but I... Or, or I, a mini... Yeah, okay. A mini, it was like a TIA, so a transient yeah. transient ischemic attack, okay. you know? Yeah. So basically the symptoms that I had were I just had this like sleeve of numbness run up my arm. So from the tips of my fingers all the way up to my shoulder. Before your cardiac and arrest. This was like April, the April before my September cardiac arrest. So April, May, okay, June, July, it. five months pr yeah. prior. Yeah, yeah. And it was this really odd sensation. And then my vision went blurry and I had to lay down in, in a dark room and only lasted a little while. I was fine. And I, I kind of, I was like, that's grand. If it happens again, I'll ring the doctor. And then it happened again the next day. So I rang the doctor and then the doctor sent me off get all these tests which subsequently came back clear that there was i hadn't had any um nothing serious had happened okay. but in the context you know of that this structural doctor that's going to close my heart wants to just check out you know the stroke risk i guess I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, yeah yeah sure yeah it's, it's crazy right because it, it, it's been now four years <laughs> Yeah, almost it's, four. Yeah, three and a half years. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy that, you know, often it's not like you survive the cardiac arrest and mm, the following year is going to be completely normal and there's no doctor appointments or anything more. Many times it's like, oh, yeah, a lot more tests, a lot more things that they find way uh, later out. Uh, so, yeah, it can take quite some years before the whole story is kind of done in a way, right? Yeah, well, that was me though. I, I like I pushed for that. Yeah, you know. Are you happy? I, I, or... I just pushed for it. Pardon? Are you glad that you pushed forward to it? Oh yeah, like yeah. whatever it is, whatever transpires, the truth is the bottom line of things for me. Okay. You know, even if it's bad news, mm. I, I'll deal with it if it's if if I know that that's okay. This is the truth yeah. of it. But also, I I. I'm driven by a need to find out the truth for my children. If yes, there's any yes. genetic component, if there's, yes. you know, all of this, uh -huh. it's so important for me to find out Yeah. so that my children are armed with this information should anything. It's for a higher purpose. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. I am, I mean, for second opinions. Yeah. I think everyone should have a second opinion almost about their, uh, reason for a cardiac arrest if it's not like a clear explanation it can it can lead to a lot more uh explanation at, uh, after a while yeah. hey sorry to interrupt the conversation between me and weenie uh this will just take a short moment you might have noticed during the conversation me wearing this awesome looking t-shirt with this really cool design uh i've created this together uh with a belgian artist here uh, so it's a collaboration and uh, yeah, we have this now on our t-shirts, which is perfect, right? For spring and summer, if you're looking for uh, a cool t-shirt to show what you are, a hard warrior, then uh, yeah, why not check out the t-shirt that we have? Uh, we have other merch, of course, right? The design uh, is also on uh, the mug here, the hard warrior mug with a cool an inspiring quote. We have pullovers, uh, so there's some options of merch, but I guess now for spring and summer, the t-shirts will be more uh, of a better choice. But, you know, go for the mug too. It's really cool. It's a good mug, really sturdy, really strong. Um, and you can put a lot of coffee, tea, or whatever you like drinking in it. So, yeah. If you will come to buy some of our merch, know that besides that i really put a lot of effort in creating good quality uh merch 
uh, with cool designs, you know, you know. Um, do know as well that it really, really, really helps out this project and does allow me to continue doing this. Basically, almost everything that I earn does go back directly into the project. And it, yeah, again, allows me to continue doing this and to do more with the project. Now, if you're not so much interested in any of our merch, uh, but you do still want to support the project, then we do also offer uh, donations. You can buy me a coffee, uh, which is basically a virtual coffee that you can buy for me. Uh, and uh, it's, well, it's the, the same principle like a donation, right? In the description, you can find a link that will, you know, take you to the merch, take you to a place to make a donation. Uh, or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash get involved to find the same link. Okay, so you, ha you, you also said that you have an SICD, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why did they, do you know why they chose for an SICD and not just a, a normal ICD? Um, my age, yeah. I think, was one reason because I was young. Um, uh -huh. And the main reason I think was they felt that not having the leads entering the heart was safer. That's the reason they gave me. Um, Wait, the SICD is not connected with leads to your heart? No, so it, it comes, so I have it here under my arm. Yeah, here. sure, sure. Uh -huh. um, and then there's a lead underneath and it uh -huh. kind of ends here. Yeah. Here. So you have yeah. one lead. I'm not sure if it's one lead or two leads. I'm not sure, but okay. it, it 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 ends here. Yeah, I can feel uh -huh. the tip of it, like when I was. Oh, you yeah. can feel actually the the lead. <laughs> well, no, I not. Do you know it's really it's really interesting. I I could when I first came out when they were first inserted. I could, I suppose, before my my muscles resettled or my body, you know, kind of adapted yeah. around it. But whenever I get like upset like if i have an upsetting thought like an emotionally upsetting thought yeah i get a little ache right at the tip of my the tip oh. of my leads it's really, really it's really bizarre it's really random but yeah. it's just it's always a little reminder to me of how much the the mind and the body and the emotions in the body are connected mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. yeah uh, but that does happen yeah mm. okay interesting but actually, you're right. I can also feel my leads here. <laughs> so I you can. So, what kind of one do you have? I think so. I'm. I can feel something really weird here, and I think it's a lead. Uh, I have a regular ICD. Um, but so it's here. I, I, yeah, it is yeah. on my chest. Yeah. Oh, I love your T-shirt. I just noticed it. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's a, uh, an it's brand new actually. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's one that I made together with an artist here for the project. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, it's cool. Uh, but yeah, I have a regular ICD. Uh, but I think because of I have a heart disease that they went for the one that had the most possibilities. Uh, so okay. I guess that's why. Okay. Yeah. How does it feel, the SICD, after four years? Are you feeling comfortable with it? How is it just? Um, I, I never notice. I barely notice, notice it. Actually, until until this weekend. When I th I think it's moved, I think it's actually moved. Oh yeah, uh, shifted oh. position. Yeah, um, and it it became very uncomfortable, um, oh. and I I can just see in its location relative to my scar. I think it's it's moved back because it's it's very it's quite bulky, like it's quite visible. And mm -hmm. um, but up to this point, yeah, like no issues, like no issues. It was very painful. The surgery I find very painful. Like the immediate aftermath. Oh my God. So painful. Like worse than childbirth almost. Really? Um, wow. Well, yeah, it was, I think it was because I didn't know when it was going to end, but with childbirth, I knew that there was like contractions oh, and then you get a rest. Right. Oh, there's a phase. <laughs> and you knew there was a child coming yeah. out and it would end. Whereas this one it was so painful. Oh my God. It was just so painful for about a, three days. Really, really painful. And then probably for a full week uh, to two weeks. It was very sore. Yeah. Just curious, how is it actually to sleep with an SICD? Because I have a regular ICD. I don't know how they call yeah. it in general, but I know that I can't sleep really well on my left side anymore because then the ICD 
gets pushed into me or it just okay. hurts like it's just uncomfortable but is that with an SICD also something like that or when you sleep on your left side goodness I or you don't notice it I probably don't sleep on that side actually anymore yeah uh, it, it, it like it, it's not painful but mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't choose to sleep on that side yeah you're right like yeah I mean it is it's right there beside my rib cage yeah 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 and i definitely think that it depends on how much weight you have on as well at a particular time you know if if uh like at the time that i got inserted i i had like very little weight there do you know what i mean like very little padding to kind of absorb it um so i think that that impacts on it as well but um, I guess so maybe. no yeah. overall it's I, I never, I rarely think about it. Rarely. Like. All right. Yeah. It's there, but it's not hindering your life. That's good. That's no. what it should be, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for Has it. Has your life, you know, after your cardiac arrest, uh, after all this, changed a lot? It's changed a lot. Like in terms of like, did you have to change jobs or are there activities... Mm. I mean, you, you mentioned like the exercises that you can do, right? But anything else like that, that it just changed a lot in your life? Uh, yeah. 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 Particularly in the immediate, I would say two years. Like I, I kind of feel I'm, I'm at the other end of it now, but it definitely took me a full two years to re regain some form of like proper normalcy I would say looking back um, yeah so the things I struggled with first were I mean I was defibrillated straight away like I was in an ambulance with paramedics they defibrillated me straight away I came around straight away so I, I wasn't down for any length of time you know um, I was really really lucky that being said, like the fit, like when I was in the hospital, I, I couldn't lift my arm without an enormous effort. You know, walking was a huge effort. And I don't know if it was just the physical trauma on my body. I, I don't actually know why, you know, given that I was resuscitated so quickly um, that it, it hit me physically so hard for so long but it but it did um and i had heard that people who had scad it, you know it, it took a long time to recover but I, i'm not sure why it did but yeah i mean when i came out first i would could only i built up my stamina by walking around my back garden so in it, and i could only walk really really slowly um so i would do one lap of my back garden and then that would me, be me done for the day. So I had to build it up really, really slowly. Because of the fatigue or yeah. why? Yeah, yeah it, it was like my body, it, it was like, I, fatigue is one word for it. It's probably the closest word for it. But it was like, my body was just like this heavy weight. Um, yeah. And I, yeah, fatigue, I guess. It's extreme I fatigue. think I know what you mean and i think i had exactly the same it's not even it's a deep kind of fatigue that it's not just like oh i'm tired it's something like your body is just completely depleted of, of energy absolutely yeah like come like to the extent that making small movements is is like a, a conscious effort you know yeah like it's and I, I, again, I was, I'm lucky. I was working at the time, but, you know, we get, you know, state assistance, government assistance if we're, if we have an illness and my, my job topped that up also. So I was able to take, I took five months off. I took five months off, off of work. Um, but going back to that kind of mind, body connection you know i i wasn't deprived of oxygen for any length of time 
but I had looking back quite substantial like cognitive deficits afterwards that persisted and I don't know if it was the trauma of you know what had happened I don't know what it was but my higher higher order cognitive thinking like took a massive took a massive hit and didn't really come back to its baseline for two years so I would say two, two years, years. For it. yeah two years wow. yeah and, and what exactly do you mean like uh like memory issues or or just issues with focusing or or what exactly were things that took two years to kind of recover it was when I went back to work that they became apparent so mm -hmm. like when I was off you know it, it it wasn't really that apparent to me but my life had become quite small you know when I was when I was on sick leave so but I I do remember some incidences where I I, I find it very difficult to like remember new faces so we had new neighbors they called over to say hello to introduce themselves they were pregnant and and, a, and going to have a baby and really lovely people and then I met them subsequently I was out for a walk and I bumped into these people and they had this tiny baby yeah. you know in a carrier you know this tiny uh -huh. beautiful tiny little baby and I could see them looking at me kind of expectantly but I just like my mind was totally blank I was like these people are strangers um and it was only afterwards I was like is this is that are they my next door neighbors and then I was like oh yes they, I, and I felt so bad because I'd essentially blocked them when they were you know <laughs> blanked them mm -hmm. when they were on their first walk with their new baby sure. or you know with the um so those type of things and when I went back to work I I went back to work at five months and my employers were great. Like they really allowed me to titrate my, my return. So I started yeah. at kind of one day back a week and then two days, but oh, I, good. it was, yeah. it was great. Like yeah. they were amazing, but, but I couldn't, I, I, after six months, I had like a total burnout because I, I couldn't, I couldn't deal with the multitasking elements that my job required like I just I just couldn't I couldn't retain information in the way that I could previously so I it'd be like I'd have like say you know maybe two screens open you know and I'd have an excel sheet on each screen and I whatever I had to put some information from one into the other and I'd be like say okay John Smith okay the name is John Smith I'm going to take that I'm going to put it into this you know excel this is just an example um, sure, sure, yeah. in the second or so in between me reading the information on one screen and going to put it in on the other screen it mm. was gone it was just like it was totally gone so i just that ability to just like retain information and i was just i was forgetting things i was forgetting really important things they were just and it was like not even that you know if you forget some things sometimes and you um you're like, oh god yeah I remember that now I've forgotten about that it wasn't like that it was like oh I have no memory of this thing ever like it was uh, one example was a meeting like an important meeting and I totally missed it and I was like I don't remember any discussion about this meeting I don't remember writing it down it's it's gone without a trace you know so those things were happening to me and I found that my tolerance for stress was just non-existent and I'd always been a person who just rolled with stress who was resilient who could just like oh it's okay I'll just push through I I I couldn't push through anymore and to be honest I still can't push through my tolerance for stress is now completely completely gone okay yeah yeah oof that sounds uh like uh two very frustrating years also right like forgetting things you know it, it was it's like everything there's like yeah. there's there's light to every dark 
You know what I mean? Because on the one side, before I had to actually re-enter the world of stress and work, it was amazing because my brain was so clear. There was like, there was just like a calmness and a sense of spaciousness in my mind that I'd never experienced. And it, Partly it was because the cardiac arrest had given me such clarity on what was important and what wasn't important because right, right. I was, I was conscious that I was going into cardiac arrest and I was conscious that like, I'm, I'm potentially dying here. Like I, I knew that in the minutes up to it happening. So that clarified everything for me. And it was like, all I want is to see my children grow up that's what I want and that was it and that was like that's a gift like I know it's it sucks to have you know a heart issue or whatever but to have that that experience that was so clarifying um that I will never lose is something that I take as like an absolute gem of a gift from this experience you know um and I I kept that that sense of like my you know, your mon my monkey brain, just like all that chatter about, oh, what about this? What about, oh, I have to do this, all that, all that stress. That went way down in that, in the, the months after the cardiac arrest. Um, and partly it was the perspective that the arrest gave me, but also partly it was because I think it was self-protected, protective, like that my, I'd experienced this trauma and the reaction to that, that trauma was to kind of just to numb to numb out a little bit you know um so that was the good part of it but then the very challenging part of it was when I I had to really re-engage my brain to for work um yeah because I never forgot things that were I never forgot things that were personally important to me like anything related to my children you know or you know their schedule or whatever that stuff I didn't forget yeah um I think it's called anthrograde amnesia. You know, you had, have okay. an incident and then today, right? You forgot everything from today to for, uh, until the incident, but not from the incident and the past, right? You still remembered maybe things from there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And how is it today, actually? Like your, your, because you said it's been, it took two years. Is it today a lot better? And also just work and in general, can you, do you feel like you can function like you used to? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Like it's, it's, it's a lot better now. I feel like I have changed and my, my priorities have shifted. Um, but that's to do with, um, not really to do with my kind of innate capacity, if you know, if yeah. you know what I mean. So it led to some big changes in my life. I, I returned sure. to my, to my job, mm -hmm. my, you know, uh, and then within five months I, I had a, to a total burnout and I left and I actually went to for a year, an administrative job where it was just kind of like data entry. And actually that is exactly what I needed to kind of retrain my brain a little bit. Yeah, so there yeah. was like no management responsibilities, no dealing with kind of other people's interpersonal issues. You know, that, you know, it was like, you've got this, this set of data. It needs to go here. It was really like mon quite mundane tasks, but actually I, that's what my brain needed. I needed to like re, yeah, you know, yeah. just rebuild those muscles a little bit so I, I did that for a year and then I um I moved jobs and I'm currently um in a part-time job that I really like you know it's it's not as stressful as my previous role and I didn't want that um and then but for a long time I wanted to train as a I went back to university when I was like in my late twenties. Again, mm -hmm. it was in yep. reaction to, I, I was like, okay, I, I wanted to be a psychologist. I was like, I'm going to start the training for it. Oh, cool. And 
I did some of the training and then I, I had my children and I went back to continue it. And I, I was working as well as having small children and then trying to do this professional training and it, it didn't work. And I prioritized my children at the time, which I would never regret. Um, but after I had the arrest, I, it, co- it caused me to reevaluate. And it's like, I don't, I don't want to spend my time doing something that I'm not really passionate about that I, I don't feel is my my calling um so I'm going back to university yeah. in October to train as a psychotherapist so not a psychologist yeah but a psychotherapist which is more yeah yeah where I'm fitted to good on you wow yeah that's amazing yeah that's super cool I'm excited thank you yeah actually I <laughs> I uh, went to university also quite late at my when I was 27 to study psychology, and I'm still studying to become a clinical psychologist. So, okay. uh, but my thing is like also you know, normally you still have quite some years to live, right? Ideally, uh, so even if I if I would be 40 and then I'm done, I am still only 40. Yeah. So I still have quite a lot of years, and I guess I mean for you the same, right? Even if you are, I don't know what age and you finished, you're probably still very young. So you still have quite a lot of years uh, to enjoy, you know, your training and what you uh, what you learned there and to do something with it. So uh, that's amazing. I really yeah. think that's cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. And you know what? I probably wouldn't have taken that leap huh. if this hadn't happened. In part because I kind of fell down if there's like a ladder, you know some notion of a career ladder or whatever I, I, I tumbled down it <laughs> and I was kind of at the start again I had nothing really to lose like a, a fresh start in a way uh, and I guess it also made you yeah like you said you prioritize things in your life more uh, it, uh, a certain urgency in life might have also appeared from this uh, event right uh, surviving a cardiac arrest mm-hmm. or I, I at least feel like it really did that like a uh, it made me realize even more that life is ending. So I should do something with that time, right? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, and luckily, of course, with the thing with the memory issues, that your brain is quite plastic. So through time and through training, uh, memory issues, yeah, can be resolved. So I'm happy to hear that it's way, way better. Yeah. Did you have any memory issues? I had, uh, when I was in the hospital, uh, a lot of memory issues because it was also during Corona. So I, uh, I was also in the hospital all by myself. No one could visit me. So, uh, that also didn't help with my memory. Right. Cause like social interaction is so important for, uh, yeah, for your memory too. So the doctors actually told my, my mom, my girlfriend to call me way more to, you know, have more interactions with people. Uh, so, um, yeah, I know some friend, a really good friend of mine uh, still makes jokes that I kept repeating myself all the time. Okay. Didn't okay. know what, what he said the, the day before. So the first week or two, I had a lot of memory issues, but then slowly, uh, yeah, it became a lot better, but it didn't take two years. So it was... Uh, maybe a couple of weeks or a, a couple of months. Yeah. Okay. And uh, now I hope it's <laughs> now I hope it's all good, <laughs> but who knows? <laughs> who knows? We um, don't know anything. <laughs> what future holds with stuff, but yeah, that's yeah. that's that's good news. Yeah, yeah, that's good news. How is actually because you have two children, right? And I guess what age are they now? Uh, like seven and nine or something. Uh, yeah, they're six and eight. Yeah, six and oh, eight. Oh, okay, six and eight, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. That event for them, because they're still very young, but do you see some effect that it had on them? Yeah, I would have worried a lot about that, you know, definitely, because they were, they woke up, my daughter in particular, who was just about to turn three, she w- she woke up you know as as it was happening um and then my son woke up and i know that my husband 
they were awake. It was the middle of the night. So we had to put them in the sitting room and turn on the TV and, you know, while the ambulance people were kind of dealing with me. So just, I, I was worried about that. And I know particularly with, well, with my daughter, for both of them for different reasons. But um, my daughter was still, had never really gone to sleep without me, mm. you know, and would have, would have had, would fe- would have had some breast milk off me before, before yeah. bed every night. Yeah. So then there was this huge wrench where I was away for two weeks. And um, when I came back, I'd had the ICD, SICD surgery. And so nobody was actually allowed to kind of touch me on, on that side. Like, so we kind of couldn't really have snuggles, proper snuggles. And so there was kind of a protracted period there. I've always like jumped at the opportunity to talk about it with them when they've brought it up in any way, you know, anything around the heart, anything around, you know, mommy being sick, mommy being away, just to put some form of words on a kind of a, what for them was probably a wordless experience, you know, kind of waking up in the night. And that's what I remember from my childhood the scariest things were those things that you couldn't put words on, you know, kind of monsters in the dark or secrets or so I've always wanted to kind of create a narrative around a story around what had hap- happened for them kind of to hang their experience on. So it wasn't shapeless and nameless. Um, and I went to, it, it took a while after, for, afterwards, but I finally connected with the team, the paramedics that, that worked on me. Oh, wow. Only last year, actually. It okay. was last year yeah. that I connected with them and I met up with them. And I really wanted to bring my kids along so that they were part of it and that they could kind of see the full, like people the story. Okay, so these are the, these are the men and women that helped mommy when she was sick. Um, they're real people. They've got names. And see me talking with these people and thanking them and creating a ritual around it. Even just we brought like food and thank you cards and presents. And there was this sense of like laughter and, you know, really dark humor, you know, as we talked about everything. And I like my kids weren't involved in the conversation but they were present so I felt this is important for them in terms of closing the circle a little bit meeting the players hearing people tell the story and laugh about it even though it's serious you know and the other thing that I really wanted to do for them was um set up well the where I live in Ireland well, we have a, a scheme. I don't know if you if if you're familiar with it, but it's a community first responder scheme whereby um, non medical or just local volunteers are trained. Uh, in, okay. yeah. uh, like a Red Cross kind of thing. Kind of like a Red Cross, where you you know they're yeah. they're trained in in CPR and defibrillation use, and they have defibrillators, and they can attend to like local community emergencies in the time it takes for the ambulance to arrive. So once the ambulance arrives, they take over, you step back. But you know yourself, um, those first minutes are absolutely critical if you have a cardiac arrest. So it's just to have a kind of a local response team on hand that can respond immediately. So there was none in my area. So I've been involved in in setting one up. And I've actually found it really quite difficult, the process of of setting it up and um, but I really have been motivated by my children like I want them to see me um take a traumatic experience and create something positive out of it that yeah. contributes to our community and yeah. see me kind of taking control and you know just being proactive in turning the experience into something positive so That's amazing. Yeah, thank you. 
It's like turning the darkness into light. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Because there is, I think there's, I think there's that capacity in everything. Yeah. I agree. You know, there's a dark and there's a light, you know? So, and I, I my son does go to play therapy as well. Yeah. Has done. And I will probably send my daughter as well. Yeah. Uh, at some time because I think as adults, you know, it's easy to forget the child's perspective on trauma, you know, yeah. how it can be so huge and they just don't have the language to, um, you know, to process it, to understand it. And it can be really, you know, life defining for them if it happens at a, an early age, particularly with a, a parent, you know, and particularly with something the magnitude of a cardiac arrest, which is life and death, you know? Yeah. I think your children are going to walk away in life with some really deep lessons from all this that you're helping to give them. So that's amazing. Uh, yeah. Let me ask um, two more questions to you, if that's okay. Is there still something today after four years that you feel is quite hard to communicate with uh, the outside world, you know, family, friends, colleagues. Is there still st something that you find very hard to communicate with them around the cardiac arrest and the things that you've went through, right? I think when you have a cardiac arrest, well, for me, I had it at, you know, a relatively young age and it wasn't something that like my peers or my friends it, it's they're not at that stage of life where they're thinking about health where they want to think about yeah dying or having uh. heart attacks as they generally would have thought it, it was so there's a certain defensiveness around it a certain like lack of desire to to really talk about it and i, I totally get that you know who wants to think about these things before course you have to you know yeah. so i think there was i probably would have found that quite hurtful at the time like quite isolating that there was a concern obviously and a, and a a desire for me to to get better and a sense of shock but behind that there was a real fear around talking about this topic mm -hmm. and maybe a lack of desire to really explore it and to understand my experience. So I found that quite isolating. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I, I get that. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I guess many survivors in a way, uh, it's an experience, especially if you're at a young age, uh, that your friends and family most of the time don't have to deal with yet. So, uh, yeah, it can be isolating, lonely, um, to have these thoughts a bit with yourself. And yeah, if you, do, do you feel like you've had someone in your life and probably you have, right? Where you have been able to, uh, talk with about these feelings and thoughts around that. Um, around yeah i mean like my i've always my husband is except i would exempt him from from that probably my previous statement i mean i've always been able to talk to him but then there's a therapist i i have a an amazing therapist and she is probably the you know the the best place to talk about these things um, hmm, yeah, probably, probably her, but I think a lot of it just needed to filter, took time, you know, and actually I, I needed to come to some form of sense of it myself, you know, internally, not just, and not just mentally, like in my body. I think, 
you know, and that's one thing I've, I've changed or has changed in me in the last number of years is I, I feel that the disconnect between, I would have lived in my head. I would have been a very heady person, you know, Uh Uh, I would have lived from my, from my head a lot. And I, I live from my, my heart much more now. I live from my kind of my felt sense of things much more. And I think that ultimately that's the only way I was, I was going to really make sense of things and, and to consider that question of, of death or, or dying was, was, was by myself mm. really, you know. Do you feel, has it been since your cardiac arrest that you went more from your head to your body and focused more on that? Yeah. Yes. That, in part because my, my head wasn't working for a fairly yeah. long time, oh, you know, it wasn't working so you, properly, yeah, yeah. but actually so you had to go to something else. I had to go to something else. I just, uh, it, it automatically happened. But then I also, you know, I started to read up on things as well. And, you know, that there's like neurons. We, we've known for a long time, there's like neurons in your gut. Like, you know, that gut yep. intelligence. But there's also yeah, neurons the in brain. your heart. Yeah, the second brain. But there's neurons in your heart too, you know? There's neurons in your heart. Like, you know, that your heart, your body and your mind are so connected. Like when we experience loss, we experience that physical sensation of a breaking heart, of heartbreak. Yeah. You know, yeah. anxiety in your tummy. Mm-hmm. You know, so I feel much more balanced now in, in the way that I experience life, you know. But I take it lighter too. Maybe it's just getting older. I don't know. But also it's because at the end of the day, we're all dying all the time, you know, so. Let's not take it too. Let's not take it too seriously. I agree. Know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I I, I find it interesting because uh, the the thing with the mind body, most people do live more in their mind than in their body, right? Even though they're both together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What has helped you actually to to be more in touch with your body? Has there been anything besides just since your head wasn't working so much that you automatically maybe focused more on it, but has, has there been other things that really helped you to be more in a way in touch uh, with it? Yeah, I suppose like I would, I would have done, I, I went back to something that was personal development work that was very important to me kind of before I had children. And then I left it when I had children and work and stuff got too busy but I prioritized going back to it once after I got sick. And I think that that work, that personal development work has, you know, has an explicit focus on kind of embodiment on, Mm -hmm. you know, awareness, breath, bringing awareness to the breath, the body, Mm -hmm. you know, and just kind of rebalancing, um, you know, the mind, body, soul connection a little bit. So that's something that I'm, I'm kind of proactively doing, you know, Mm -hmm. practicing. Yeah. It's often not very complicated things in the end that you uh, have to use to be more in touch with your body. Like breathing is a great one. That's true. Yeah. Breathing, sensing, just, you know, the, the whole thing, but like, I have such an, I have such an appreciation for my body. I think, you know, like my body, my heart in particular I often have a little chat with my heart. I'm like, you know, you're, you know, you've been hurt. You've been damaged. Like my heart's a bit damaged now, but you're like, you know, you're still beating constantly, keeping me alive. You know, thank you. That's a very kind way. Yeah. To, uh, to talk to your heart and to your body. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's day in, day out, year in, year out. It's, you know, it's working. It's true. You know? Mm-hmm. And I think so many of the messages, like so many people, but I would have gotten growing up in in kind of Western culture is around, 
you know, your body needs to be, your body's too, the wrong shape. It's the wrong size. It's, mm. you know, it's not mm -hmm. fast enough. It's, it was something to control, something to. To perfect like, in a way. To perfect. So. Yeah. But it's, it's already like, perfect. So, you know, it's. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Because I know some cardiac arrest survivors feel like their body has betrayed them. Because, you know, it okay. let them down. Right. Okay. Um, but I, I feel, and I mean, everyone, uh, yeah, I feel it's a bit like a negativity kind of bias. You focus just on the one thing that went wrong, but you, in a way, ignore all the other thousands of times, millions of times that it worked correctly. So maybe a little bit of a shift in, 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 in yeah, focus. Um, but your body is working most of the time to almost always, uh, yeah, it's working correctly and, and doing its job. So uh, I like it what you said. Yeah. Yeah. It's more That's of a interesting kind of though. I, I can understand why you could have the, the opposite reaction too, that your yeah. body let you down. Oh. You know, I, I can understand that too. And that's interesting. I think that must be difficult, you know, because then it's a kind of a embattled state, you know, kind of you against your body a little bit that, yeah. you know. Yeah, that's... yeah, that's that's a good point. Yeah. Winnie, I have one last question. Um, I know you still have things to do at, in your day, right? So, uh, one more question: Is there a last kind of best tip, or just a last words that you want to share with any survivor listening? Um, be kind to yourself. You know, go easy on yourself. You know, if you're feeling whatever you're feeling, it's just, it's okay. Like even, it, you know, I, I remember th having this experience probably two years out where I'd had this extended period of like gratitude and euphoria and mental clarity and this sense of like urgency around life. And, you know, and then I went through a period where I was like, oh, Winnie, like you, you had this incredible experience and then you've wasted it and you've gone back into your old patterns and, you know, you're wasting time. You're, you know, you've gone back into kind of an old dullness of living. And I was really beating myself up about it. And yeah. somebody else had to say to me, Winnie, like, stop. Like, that's, you know. That's so you're being so hard on yourself. You're being so unfair on yourself. Whatever you're feeling in this moment, it, it it's okay. You know, like you don't have to feel any particular way. You don't have to feel joy or gratitude or strength. Yeah. Mm. Like just just be kind to yourself because at the end of the day you've gone through a really your body and your mind and your soul have gone through a really, really difficult experience. Um, and in ways, some ways you probably don't even, your mind can't comprehend it, you know, so stop being hard on yourself. You know, that's the advice I would give. And there's no timeline for things. Everybody's different. Everyone has different experiences. Um, and listen to your, listen to your heart, listen to your gut, you know, yeah, trust yourself, trust your own inner knowing about what you need and where you're at. Winnie, thank you. That's beautiful. Yeah, good words. You'll be a great psychotherapist. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> that means a lot to me. Yeah. I, I, that does. It, yeah, thank you so much. All right, that concludes this conversation between me and cardiac arrest survivor and heart warrior Winnie uh, Donahue. I hope that you gained something out of this conversation between us, you know, uh, maybe some insights some tips, some lessons, some wisdom to make this journey a little bit easier of surviving cardiac arrest. You're not alone, you know, as I hope uh, that you may feel from these episodes here on the podcast. There are other people out there in different countries around the whole world uh, who go through a cardiac arrest. So there are more heart warriors out there. Uh, now to find anything mentioned in this conversation and any additional, you know, resources around surviving a cardiac arrest, do check out the show notes, which are located in the description of this episode. 
or go directly to hardwarriorproject.com slash podcast and search for Weenie. I hope that I get the chance to welcome you again at some point here on the podcast. Until then, take good care of yourself, right? And uh, yeah, hope to see you on another episode. This is your host, Elis Fass, signing off. Bye. Oh, before you do take off, um, well, if you're interested to support this project uh, and you're interested to just have some cool merch designed for hard warriors, then, you know, as you can see here, uh, me wearing our brand new t-shirt uh, with our brand new design on it. Uh, if you're interested, then check out her merch. I will place in the description a link that will take you to the place where you can find our merch. And the t-shirt comes in many different colors. So there's options, you know, uh, and there's probably something that will suit your style. And I guess because spring and summer is upon us, uh, well, it's perfect now to buy a t-shirt, right? Uh, we have other merch, right? We have our Heart Warrior mug. Now, if you're not so much interested in our merch, but you are still interested in, uh, you know, you still want to support the project, then you can also uh, make a donation. You can buy me a virtual coffee uh, with Kofi, uh, which is basically the same principle as just a donation, right? Uh, I will not buy a coffee from that as I don't drink coffee anymore uh, for my heart, but I will use that money to better this project. Whether you come to buy a t-shirt or another piece of merch or make a donation, you are with that having a direct effect on the awareness of cardiac arrest. So thank you truly, truly, if you will come to buy uh, some of our merch or to make a donation. Okay, with that, thanks again for being here and uh, hope to see you soon on another episode.